In my opinion, Bitcoin has a chance of being a 500 year money, but what it means is it will extend through the social cycles. You could call it fourth turning cycles. You could call it a long term debt cycle from Ray Dalio. There's all these different cycles in society. If Bitcoin can survive multiple cycles, multiple social climates, then we have something really special here. Yeah. So my belief looking back on Occupy is that eventually it was co-opted by our three letter agencies. That's mm -hmm. that's a fact now, they admit that. And what does it look like? If Bitcoin is totally neutered from a self-custody privacy standpoint, what does that leave us with? Now, when we look at the government coming down on Bitcoin, I think the best phrase is that we're, we're at the end of the beginning. I think we're entering that phase now and Bitcoin needs to be able to handle this type of attack. And it's Mr. Brandon Quidham, thank you so much for joining me here today and being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Brandon. I'm excited about this one. Yeah, no, I uh, I always enjoy talking to you and you, you've done you know, many interviews throughout the years and, um, you know, obviously, <laughs> I guess, you know, was it infamous or famous for the, uh, the, you know, the mushrooms and mycelium and Bitcoin and, and going down that route. We can, you know, we'll touch on that here today. I don't want to necessarily, um, you know, rehash that. If people can go kind of watch that uh, many different times and talking about that. But, um, you know, wanted to get a little bit of your story a little bit here today and just getting to Bitcoin, um, where it's led you now to Swan and in some of the opportunities you've had because of you know just thinking about diff bitcoin differently and you want to touch on too just some of the things going on in bitcoin i was talking to nico the other day and uh just dropped it today actually and, and you know you know politics being a third rail we did you and i were talking offline about minnesota and michigan you know the political landscape a little bit and just the demographics but also the you know you see the infighting a little bit too with just with bitcoiners right it's just humans we're constantly fighting even bitcoiners even though we're aligned on so many things and helps left and right come together we're still fighting on things we still manage to find uh, fight about things um i would love for you to just start with like where what have you been thinking about lately like where where's your mind been where do you see the the bitcoin landscape and in, in kind of where where you see it going right now but just from the the social aspect and between again the politics that are going on but also the bitcoiners infighting with their whether it's ordinals and inscriptions and all kinds of things going on and is it good is it bad everyone's got a spectrum of where they think that is and what you know so where where does brandon quidham sit on that on that spectrum but also where do you see things at right now from your perspective yeah, definitely. I, I would say my sort of high level thought process right now is that the honeymoon's over. And I think that the period of Bitcoin's life where the majority of the community is aligned, uh, I think that sort of ebbs and flows over time, right? There's like a coherent narrative for the, the mass of people. And then there's a shake up, let's say the block size war. And then we have this like hardening effect where everyone's marching to the same uh, the beat of the same drum, good or bad, that just sort of happens. And I would say now we're starting to fracture again. And I think that this is a natural process. I think this is a totally reasonable, expected process. It does not worry me. And the reason why it doesn't worry me is because if Bitcoin can't handle some infighting, it can't handle some uh, narrative battles or fracturing of communities, then this thing was never going to make it long term anyways. Right. So I actually am totally comfortable with the amount of tension we have in the market right now. Um, I would also say that Bitcoin Twitter feels like this big war fight over the protocol, but that has almost no reality. Like that does not represent Bitcoin as a whole. And I'll use Swan as an example here. Um, over the last several years, right, Swan's been around for over four years now. We've done some things that people like. We've done some things that people don't like in the community. And so I've seen firsthand how the horde on Bitcoin Twitter can change its opinion about you or attack you one day, love you the next or whatever. And what's interesting is whether Bitcoin Twitter loves Swan or Bitcoin Twitter hates Swan. Uh, obviously, neither are true. It's, it's in the middle. But no matter what's going on in Bitcoin Twitter, it is not correlated to our business in any capacity. So we'll have every, like we deal with it in terms of, OK, we're having to deal with a bunch of PR stuff on Twitter today. So it wastes our time. But you go look at the numbers, the client onboarding, customer sentiment, that stuff doesn't move at all based on Bitcoin Twitter. So I think it's healthy for all of us to zoom out. Uh, Bitcoin Twitter is not Bitcoin. Um, in terms of back to where we are today, I think that um, we're going to start to figure out what this Bitcoin thing is. And I think 
over time, every single, let's say, cultural battle that we have, it helps us understand more about what Bitcoin actually is. If you think about in the beginning, people thought Bitcoin competed with Visa, fast, cheap payments. That was an enormous yeah. narrative. And then it led with a fork or ended up with a fork. That's one idea. The other idea said, let's scale in layers, blah, blah, blah. And so I think we're going to do the same thing now. I hope we don't end up with a fork. Um, if we do, okay, fine. The minority fork will be worth nothing in five years. I think we learned that lesson. I expect the same thing to occur. Now, when we look at the government coming down on Bitcoin, um, I think the best phrase is that we're, we're at the end of the beginning. Um, so the first phase is over. Honeymoon is over. We are now firmly on the radar of all power structures in, in the world. And now it's going to be an interesting thing where we're going to find out who actually has the, the cojones to try and fight this thing, who's going to try and subvert it, who's going to lean into it. I think we're going to have a plurality of responses from governments. I think what the Biden administration is showing, uh, whoever's driving that ship, they're very hostile right now, but they're not hostile to Bitcoin ownership. They're not hostile really to number go up. They're hostile to privacy, self-custody, things like that. And I think that's to be expected. I think that's where the battle lines are in this next phase. Like there's no, you can't put Bitcoin away. It's not going away. All they can do now is try to tax it and spy on it and maintain some amount of control. And I think it's on Bitcoiners shoulders to enter that fight bright eyed and bushy tailed and know that they're going to try to neuter this thing. And the next question is if Bitcoin is totally neutered from a self custody privacy standpoint, what does that leave us with? Um, is, is that, is that the hill to die on? And I'm not actually sure what the answer to that question is. Everyone can make up their own answer to that, but I think we're entering that phase now and Bitcoin needs to be able to handle this type of attack. And it's on us to build the tools that prevent it from being captured. Um, I think all other crypto projects, they're dead on arrival. They don't have the capacity to survive a state level attack. Um, and so they're just inevitably going to be captured if they get big enough. But I think Bitcoin is the one that we have, a, that we do have a legitimate chance uh, to get this thing, to get this thing through and make it too big to fail. The, and and I, I agree too. I mean, it's, it's, I keep coming back to though, this, you know, I feel like so many of us in Bitcoin, it seems absurd when you don't understand Bitcoin, right? And we've all gone through this gauntlet. We've like, I mean, literally every single person, um, save maybe a, a couple people, you know, every one of us, you know, we come in and we don't get it right away or there's something we're missing or whatever it is. And we have to go through this gauntlet, this learning process. And, you know, everyone has to fit through that, that narrow doorway basically and get through that and a lot of us i think we we try to whether it's you know writing articles you know all the work that you've done you know doing content right people doing podcasts like all these different things there's a million different ways people are trying to you know build companies you know whatever it is and try to speed the the adoption up and education up in this world in the bitcoin world you're trying to minimize collateral damage and that's the only thing i can keep coming back to of you know you don't want your friends your family your people around you to get burned and it just feels like that's the way humans have to learn though. You know, like you're just constantly fighting this battle of, are we ever going to learn this lesson? And, you know, is that, you know, like Luke Broyles, you know, will always, you know, always say to me like, well, we, we got to, I, I, I tend to be more idealistic and, and where the pragmatist would say, Hey, we got to meet them where they are. We got to talk about price more and, and number go up. And I, I can't, I can't stand that stuff, you know, but I know that that's like, that's where a lot of people are. And that's where a lot of this emanates from. Um, you know, what, what do you, do, like, what do you believe? Like, is the, is it Canadian, Canadian trucker things have to happen where like uh, Trudeau comes in and is doing ridiculous stuff or people have to learn or, or can we get there through education over time and get to 10 million Bitcoiners or whatever it might be where people, we can start adopting this and get a couple percent of people to sway public sentiment and for whatever it is, politicians to change and make it legal tender. I mean, I don't know. I mean, who know? do we even know what we want in a way, right? So where, where do you kind of see this for, for whether it's adoption and, and the ways that people are coming in from all these different ways? And I grapple with this a lot. Like, gosh, I, why am I doing this? Like I, you, you know, why are you doing this? Like we could just go back and sit or sit around and just go into the shadows and do nothing. Like, why are we out here being activists in a way and promoting this mm -hmm. and it seems fruitless at times i don't know so you know where where do you stand in this 
Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this one. Um, and while, while you were talking there, I looked up an article I wrote. I published it in January 2019. So I did the thinking on this in 2018. But it's Bitcoin culture wars. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And we kind of just touched on it. But the thesis is we go to battle in the narrative war online. We sharpen. We figure out what Bitcoin is or we get closer to the truth. The, the whole culture around Bitcoin, the people around it get a cultural upgrade. We, we learn from these moments. And then we harden the narrative. We get sharper on explaining it. It's easier to explain it to people that are new. And so that's sort of my, my overall take there. In terms of evangelism, why are we doing this? Why does it matter? Why do people get called to this thing? Um, in my opinion, the state of uh, culture in the West is abysmal right now. And what I mean by that is young people do not feel optimistic about the future. Young people yeah, in general awesome. believe that politicians, that... Uh, boomers which is kind of just a lazy shorthand but all the power structures we have are failing us and there's nothing to look forward to and that is a horrible place for young people to be if that's your starting place you're not going to raise a family you're not going to start a business you're not going to be good members of society you're going to just be more degenerate and it's not it's it's logical to come to that conclusion if there is no, if tomorrow is not going to be here, you, we might as well just party today. And so I think this comes out with YOLO investing. I'm not going to save diligently for 20 years. The world's going to be gone in 20 years. I might as well just YOLO it all in Dogecoin, right? And so that behavior is all over the place. Now, the other question is if that's true, which I think it's undeniably true, and you feel motivated to do something about it, what can you do? Well, you can go get involved politically. You can go to Occupy Wall Street. You can go to whatever crazy environmental, save the planet, throw paint on the Mona Lisa, whatever whatever thing you think you can do to try and change the system. You can just direct your political energy there. Um, I, I was doing this nonstop from, let's say, 2014 to 2017, like making phone calls for Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 as an example. So I was politically engaged. I thought I could change the system. Um, I quickly realized that, and I call that uh, method vote harder, by the way, just vote harder. I, and what I found out is that's not going to work. That's not effective. Uh, best case scenario, you're talking like 1% change. And then I start learning about technological revolutions. I find Bitcoin. I figure out that uh, to steal a Bucky Fuller quote, um, to change the world, um, you have to make, make the old system obsolete. So essentially, let's use technology to enact our political desires in the world and force change on the world by creating tools that either can't be stopped or empower people to do things a different way. Um, I think Bitcoin is the perfect or ultimate representation of um, building the future you want to see. And it's by making unstoppable tools. It's creating a monetary system that no humans can meddle with or no individual humans can meddle with. And I think that's actually the fundamental value of this thing is it's that we're recognizing that in the past we allowed humans to or a small group of people to control the money printer. And even the best humans under the best intentions ultimately are full of it. They break, they steal, they get greedy or they or the barbarians are at the gate. We got to print money to save ourselves. And it's very easy to justify that. In many cases, that's probably true. So raise money to go to war. Um, however, if you can just quickly say, oh my gosh, war is coming we need your money, uh, even if war is not actually coming, that's not a, that's a perverse incentive. That's a moral hazard, right? So Bitcoin is taking the radical position that no human should be allowed to meddle with the monetary supply. And that is an extremely radical idea. And that's what we're playing out here. In my personal belief, that is a very sound idea with good logic. I think it will... Um, in the fullness of time, I think it will be extremely obvious that that is how money should be run. Um, we're still right in the middle of that battle, but I think that's where we're going. Now, in terms of uh, evangelism, okay, nihilism is the, the situation. Vote harder or, or jump on this Bitcoin thing, right? Jumping on the Bitcoin thing all of a sudden gives you some optimism in your life because you genuinely feel that your time and your talents are serving a purpose larger than yourself that has a legitimate chance of improving the world around you. And I think humans in general need to have something larger than themselves if we want to operate at our best, 
right? It's easy for me to be selfish and do my own thing and take pleasure learning, reading, whatever. Um, but there's no way I'm at my best if I'm self-serving. And so maybe that's have a family, maybe that's a religion, maybe that's work for a company or a nonprofit or an idea like Bitcoin that you believe will change the world. And I think what we what we find out is um, both one aiming at something bigger than yourself just puts you on the right path. Then Bitcoin all of a sudden starts to make you a little bit more wealthy, assuming you stay humble, stack sats, have some time on your side. Most people find themselves in a better financial system. Uh, situation. What does that do? Now, all of a sudden, it's easy to be optimistic about the future, to think long term, to have a family, to get healthier. All these things are correlated with being optimistic about the future. And so when you start to get a taste of that, then you interact with the Bitcoin community and you realize that, whoa, uh, most of my, let's say, normie friends are not so great to be around. I leave kind of feeling sad. Uh, I'm not necessarily speaking about me personally, like in general, there's a juxtaposition between mainstream culture and Bitcoin culture. You start swimming in Bitcoin culture and you realize that there's a fraternity of people who are bettering themselves, who are optimistic about the future, who are genuinely good people. And you go, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, this is the community I want to spend time with. This makes me want to be a better person. This is a, a group of people trying to change the world. I want to be a part of this. And so then you get swept up in that ecosystem, you genuinely feel like you discovered a secret to the universe and you start evangelizing like a psychopath to all your friends and your family. You're like I figured out the secret and rightfully so humans have this uh, gut uh, radar when, when they hear bullshit, they know. And so we come off like charlatans, we come off like cult members. And so people dismiss us and we fail at orange pilling. We're too eager. Right. And I think most Bitcoiners go through this arc where you discover the secret to the universe. Then you alienate all your friends and family for being a psychopath. Then, you know, it's a hero's journey. Then you go back in the cave and you go, wait, you know, if you're aware, wait a minute, why am, why is this not working? Oh, I'm being too eager. And then you sort of refine your pitch. And at that point, you're actually ready to evangelize, which is a much more, I think Matt O'Dell said, like, shill lightly. I think that's the right approach. It's like leave breadcrumbs, um, but you can't you can't hit someone over the head with this one. It, it's too big, and genuinely understanding Bitcoin is is a challenging process. And most people most people are intellectually capable of this, but their ego gets in their way, their preconceived notions get in the way, their desire to fit in with the social herd uh, gets in the way. Because if it's not socially acceptable in their friend group, it comes at a high cost to adopt such a thing. And so all the early Bitcoiners, in my opinion, are generally like the highest correlation of early Bitcoiners is they're comfortable not following the herd. They're, they're, they're on the vanguard of culture. They're on the vanguard of society. For whatever reason, they're comfortable being an outsider, at least to some extent. And I think we're starting to cross uh, the threshold there where all of a sudden now Bitcoin is almost mainstream enough where you get social points for adopting Bitcoin rather than social points uh, for avoiding Bitcoin. And so once that happens, it's game over. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but we're getting there. Um, yeah, that was a long winded answer. <laughs> Hopefully I got oh, to the, the heart of your question. It's funny because you, you literally like hit a couple of the questions I kind of had, which is, which is great. Like, um, you know, like I had like men or people like you have, you know, like there's a lot of men in Bitcoin. I mean, just naturally like men, I feel like they, they want to make an impact, right? They're either for thousands of years, they were going to war and that was their impact or they're going into some leadership positions and like, that's how they made impact. And so you see a lot of men in Bitcoin or whatever it might be, or these financial or high flying positions just naturally or just over time. So anyway, you, you touched on that, which I think is great. One of the, you made me think of too, like, again, like the shill lightly, I, the, one of the things I've just, I've loved doing, cause again, I've gone through that journey too, right? Like you said, a lot of us have gone through that journey of like, we're too eager. And then you kind of have to back up and refine, okay, what self-awareness, like, why, why is this not catching? Cause it seems obvious, but like embracing and amplifying, right? Like extend to the logical conclusions, like these things of like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to have these 
people. If you've got a better answer than me, and then like, let's play it out. Let's extend to the logical conclusion. What you're telling me is right. If a, if a thousand dollars stimmy check is great, then then a million dollars stimmy check would be even better, right? Like, explain to me that, right? And then you have a Jared Bernstein who the guy can't even understand or explain his very MMT philosophy that he's supposed to know and he's flouting, right? So I mean when you act like, Hey, I'm five, you, you explain that to me actually instead. And instead of us trying to fight facts or, or, or emotion with our own facts, it's just, anyway, it's, that's a whole, you know, separate, um, separate world that we could get into. And you can, you could touch on too. My, my one thing was, and I love that you said Bucky Fuller too, by the way, um, just you may think of govern me harder, everything, but vote harder, everything, but just Bucky Fuller is great. But, you know, Bitcoin, you said, I don't know if it was in Preston's, I think it was in Preston's uh, interview you did in the past year that you did with him. You said uh, Bitcoin could be, uh, instead of a 50-year money, which is what a lot of fiat currencies are just on average, right? Uh, you could be a 500-year money. And I know like a George Gammon, his biggest problem, a lot of the debates back and forth with Jeff Booth would, are, hey, I don't think humans are going to change like you think they're going to change, Jeff. Like Bitcoin, maybe it does change people. And I know for a lot of us, it has changed us. We've seen it. And so we might disagree with Je with George there, but the thing where I think George is somewhat right, the thing I've been kind of grappling with in a way is what if, what about the next fourth turning, right? Like a hundred years from now or 80 years from now, when, when people had it really easy, when, when Tomer's world is happening, you know, generational wealth and it's like, ah, things are amazing and people have it even easier or, or that type of world, uh, you know, I guess, quote unquote, it's easier do people forget, you know, like, are, are, do we, are we doing ridiculous things again? You know, like, what are your thoughts on like, again, where we are a hundred years, like say what we, what we think is going to happen happens. Is it that next fourth turning where people are like, yeah, this is great. Like we can do crazy credit. We can do ridiculous things. Like, what are your thoughts in that regard? I don't know how much thought I'm sure you have, but you know, maybe it's what, you know, your thoughts a hundred years from now or 80 you know, years from now, this 50 to 500 year money. If you're enjoying this show and you want to get more involved in educating the public, in Trojan horsing them, accepting truth and sound money across the world, there's no better way than using one collectible, valuable Bitcoin trading card at a time. This is a company that I am directly involved with, documenting the concepts, people, the timestamps of history, the value of these cards is incredible. But the most important part is the education they provide, talking about those timestamps in history and educating people on the backs of the cards of what is actually going on, doing the job that are government run compulsory schooling will not do. If you put in playable characters at checkout, you will receive 10% off at checkout, playable characters, the name of the show, you will receive 10% off. I cannot wait for you to be a part of this tribe and get your hands on some of these cards and start orange filling and Trojan horse people around the world. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll end with the 50 to 500 year money. Um, first, I want to touch on the one you mentioned with George Gammon versus Jeff Booth. Gammon takes the position that, um, people aren't gonna change. Human nature is relatively fixed. And Jeff Booth maybe takes a more uh, liberal interpretation of that where he, he sees change already, so he anticipates mm -hmm. future change too. I think both people are entirely true. Um, yeah. I think where George Gammon uh, is wrong is the fact that these are subtle changes. Um, I think what George Gammon sees is he sees a bunch of Bitcoin crazy people on Twitter and he's, he thinks, he, he thinks that our position is that everyone's going to be like us. That's yeah. definitely not true. And so George is right, but I think that's not actually a good argument because yeah, yeah. It's conflating a tiny group with like the masses, the masses won't change. And it's my belief that all of this fits in perfectly with human nature. And I'm, so I agree with George, human nature is very hard to change. And so my belief is that a new monetary system, let's say inflationary versus deflationary, we, we go from a fiat system to a Bitcoin system. In that world, prices are going down forever because technology and markets drive prices down. That's just a fact. And in that world, the average person will not notice any change. The average person will just subconsciously act slightly different. And all, that, that matters in aggregate. Right. If every single person believes that their savings account will be worth more tomorrow if they just save in Bitcoin, that changes the world in a huge, huge, huge way. Right. A, a butterfly flaps his wing in China and it's a tsunami over there, whatever. Um, I think that's absolutely true. So subtle change and it adds up to a big change in aggregate. Um, most people, yeah, I think the people whose lives are radically going to change, they're going to become Bitcoin disciples. I think we're approaching 
saturation there. Um, I think in five to ten, five years to ten years, maybe Bitcoin conferences will not be this like cool revolutionary cultural breakthrough anymore. Um, and so I think it's you know I feel fortunate that we're here during this early stage. Um, I think we'll look back on this time and be like, wow, we were really a part of something important here. And I think it's on us all to take a deep breath and appreciate the moment and not get caught up in the next battle or the next tweet or whatever. I think we're in, in the middle of something special. So, okay, to the heart of your question, 50-year money or 500-year money? This is something I've been wrestling with for a while, and it's part of my curiosity of, okay, how are we wrong? How is this thing going to fail? Mm -hmm. what, if, yeah. what if I'm drinking the Kool-Aid too? And the thought process for me is that I feel very confident that Bitcoin will take um, center stage or something like center stage in the monetary battle for, let's say, the next 30 to 50 years. OK, and is that a win? Right. Do we feel good about that? And on, in some ways, yes. Right. We, we yeah. bought ourselves some time. We, we got some freedom or whatever in the digital age. But eventually Bitcoin gets captured, just like all the other money, and we have to figure out a new game, right? Satoshi actually had a quote like this. He said, I don't know if this is the end all be all, but I know it's it's a it'll give the individual a leg up in the arms race against the state, something like that. And so S Satoshi conceded early on that this might not be the end all be all, but I do think it gives us some individual liberty. And so that's kind of the framing. And it's my belief that we're, we already guaranteed ourselves a 50 year money, right? And what do I mean by that? Okay, between 1913 and 1944 was one money, right? Pre Bretton Woods, post World War One, post Federal Reserve, that's, that's a type of money. Then the Bret, uh, Bretton Woods system, that's another type of money. Then 71 on after we left the gold window, it became the petrodollar system. Um, and now we're kind of in the treasury bill standard in a way, like the, the gold reserve currency is U.S. government debt. And so each of these are slightly different iterations of a money and they change as market conditions, as people demand things. And so, OK, fine. Bitcoin's the next one of those. Who gives a shit? In my opinion, Bitcoin has a chance of being a 500 year money. And I just use that arbitrarily as a number. But what it means is it will it will extend through the social cycles. You could call it fourth turning cycles. You could call it a long-term debt cycle from Ray Dalio. There's all these different cycles in society. But if it, if it can serve, if Bitcoin can survive multiple cycles, multiple social climates, then we have something really special here. And I think that's the heart of the question. And my honest belief, uh, or my, my honest take today is that we have a chance. Bitcoin has a chance. It's the first money that has a proper chance but to have any sort of confidence 50 plus years from now uh, would be crazy. And so I think it's our duty to, uh, as Bitcoin sign guy says, provide cover fire until Bitcoin gets through the door and we'll see where, where it ends up. Um, but it's, it's our job to shepherd this thing as far as we can go and see where we can take this thing. Yeah, I love that you say it like that. And I didn't know that that Bitcoin sign guy said that, actually. So I love that he said that, too, like the cover fire. It's it's so good. And I, I liken it to um, like a year or two ago, I was it kept coming up like I kept saying and I, I feel like it was on like Cafe Bitcoin or like it, it was, you know, Alex or, or, you know, of course, it was like some vets or like Shane Hazel. We kept saying like Bitcoin gives you the high ground, right? Like, you know, central banks and like kings and despots all had the high ground for so long with fiat or coin clipping or melting things down. And now Bitcoin, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin reversed that like Bitcoin gives you the high ground now. And you're now have the, the angle on the, uh, on fiat and, and the angle on you know, central banking. So I love that. Um, I love you said that. And it, the, the founding fathers, again, like I, I think this, again, the going about the George Gammon thing and the things that uh, some of the thinkers I'll say, I guess, and maybe even some of the, the the wonks or even even the economists i'll give some of them credit whether it's i mean god love them the jared bernsteins of the world or the paul krugmans where they're so caught up in in what they're doing almost at times where it's you know they can't see the forest beyond the trees where like the founding fathers they had gold and silver but like i feel like some of them for how genius those guys were they still maybe missed the mark on some of the money aspect like thinking 
beyond they couldn't see beyond their own fourth turning right and I, I feel like this is some something that keeps coming up with humans where we it's hard to outlast when you're not here anymore how do you pass that down right we think of like generational second family or second generation third generation they lose a family fortunes like how do you extend beyond that like you said bitcoin is really that first time we maybe can get outside that generational fourth turning where we can actually pass things down truly um keep things going so it's boy is this it, you could spend hours just kind of going back and forth on this but buying us time i think is is so well said and i yeah i love that satoshi quote too speaking yeah. of question for you um, yeah like the the founding fathers actually were keenly aware that centralized banking was bad yeah. uh, what's interesting is that they were aware they said it I, I don't know if it was andrew jackson or jefferson but i don't even know if this is a real story but apparently he like punched a central banker in a Congress or something like that. Um, and so essentially they, they knew the evils of this and they they best intention, they created a government to distribute power. I think yeah. on paper, it's the right or the best form of government, government we've ever come up with. But what's interesting here is that even with all the checks and balances and the right intentions, America has decayed over time. And I, I've done a lot of thinking with the, through the thesis of the fourth turning. We can go there or not. I don't care. But the author of the fourth turning, Neil Howe, made an interesting comment, which was that in the however many hundred years since we've founded America, there's actually been three different republics. And we're fighting over the future of the fourth American republic. And what he means is that for his, for his thesis, like you go through a fourth turning, you have a shakeup, and then you sort of re-architect the systems and you kind of give and take on liberties and laws and structures and whatnot. And we're doing that right now. And so what does this mean for Bitcoin, right? Satoshi white paper is, is the founding fathers of principles, but now it's on us as a culture, as a society, as people to do what we can to shepherd this thing and try to preserve the values. Because at the end of the day, the software, uh, the system of Bitcoin is great, but it is on us, like our, our impact and how we work with this thing matters. And so if we just wake up and 50 years go by and none of the original like revolutionary energy is left in Bitcoin, then there's no one to fight if the government wants to fork in KYC mandatory or whitelist transactions only or whatever. So we have to figure out a way to preserve the cultural values long term. I don't know how to do this, by the way, but let's say the church, the Catholic church or secret societies or governments or companies, they all have ways of preserving wisdom. Um, maybe we need to have like a, a weird priest class in Bitcoin to preserve the values. Maybe we need to, I, I know how crazy these things sound, but when you start looking out long term, like multi-generations, this stuff all of a sudden starts to matter. Um, let me have endless examples of this, but anyways, quick, quick aside back to you. Honestly, like I, again, we could, we could do a whole set, record, record a whole separate thing, which you might have to at some point about this thing. Cause I, it, it, to me is the thing I keep coming back to now. And, and again, kudos to George Cam Gammon in, in that sense where he, he was beating that down and you're right. The founding fathers, they were keenly aware, obviously beat back central banking, put, you know, had gold and silver in their writings, talked about it in their journals, and everything. And they didn't have the tool necessary to, to have a, a Bitcoin at the time or whatever it was. Um, but like, you can't have capitalism on fiat, you know, like it's a, it's a, it's building a society on sand. And I think that's where capitalism keeps falling short. And like, for me, I was very conservative growing up and on, on the right, the Republicans, like, Oh, it's, you know, whatever. And it's like, the thing that woke me up was Oh eight crash. And George Bush came in and started bailing stuff out. I'm like, that's not what we stand for. Like, what are you doing here, buddy? And that to me was the kind of final nail in the coffin as a, as a kid, you know, whatever we, we were at that age, high school or whatever it was and uh, college. And, and so that to me was like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Like, what are we doing here? Then seeing Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, which were the same thing. They were the, they were two sides of the same coin, but the media was telling everyone, yeah, you're against each other. You hate each other. And it's like, n n no, like looking back, it's like, wow, how we were all so hoodwinked. And it was, you know, Tea Party wanted 
to minimize government and get government out of their lives. Well, the you know Occupy Wall Street wanted to get corporations and the bankers out of their lives. <laughs> it's like it was they were the same movement. And because what we didn't realize at the time was that they were in, truly in bed together, we, really actual fascism. And we've had it for really probably decades and really no one knew it. Like no one could really see what was happening because we didn't have social media. We didn't have the ability to have to see what was going on in the inside. The king was up there in his ivory tower and we had no idea until the internet started coming around. So for all the ills of social media and this and that, we wouldn't know any of this otherwise. So anyway, I'd say we could do, I mean, whole segments on this or hours on this, because this to me is the most fascinating part in the generational getting beyond into this 500,000 year money to me and beyond the generational divide is the most important, I think, talks and how to, how do we figure this out? Totally. I'm looking back at Occupy, uh, Tea Party, or any of these like counter counter force narratives or movements or whatever, um, my the cynical side of me believes that these are sanctioned. Okay, let me let me back up. When society's in a bad bad situation, um, culturally, there's like pressure building culturally, and if you don't address it, it we burn down the cities, right? And so, if you're a smart government. Uh, you definitely don't want the people to burn down the city. So if you start to notice some political energy that's growing and growing and growing, the best thing to do is to have a pressure release valve, let people vent, let people express their anger in a way that doesn't actually advance their goals, right? So my belief looking back on Occupy is that eventually it was co-opted by our three-letter agencies. That's, Mm -hmm. That's a fact now, they admit that. And what does it look like? It looks like a pressure release valve. It looks like a way to capture all the political energy and let people believe they're making a difference. When in reality, they're spinning their wheels. There's absolutely no change coming from this. And you just neuter all that political energy into a dead end, essentially. Right. And where I think Bitcoin's different is that it captures the same political energy of, you know, good, good grievances out of Occupy and yeah. Tea Party. Uh, yeah. But no fangs, no tools, no actual solutions. Whereas Bitcoin's unique here, um, honestly unique in the long arc of human history where the little guy actually has a tool that's asymmetrically in favor of the individual against power structures. That's extremely rare. Um, I'm trying to even come up with examples like there aren't many. Yeah. Yeah. We have this defensive technology and we can express our political will into a tool that actually can get it done without being stopped. That's a special thing. Um, I don't remember Jack Dorsey's quote, but he he was captured by that exact thing. He's like, there is something special here. We need to preserve this thing and take it as far as we can because this does not come lightly or frequently throughout history. No, that's so well said and it really is the first time like you said i i both sides i'm sure were three letter agency type of stuff. any anytime you see stuff like this whether it was probably a couple of years ago um at the capitol or that tea party occupy wall street like you're gonna find the blm protest i mean you, you're in the back in your backyard you know like that that was all these things are captured you know like there's there's real fervor there like that's you know people get mistaken like Oh, was COVID real? Like, well, yeah, of course it was a real thing, but like how it was handled, all these things, like where did it start? Those are all the things that were taken and just ran, the lies were just rampant, but the thing was real. And like, for some reason, people have like this time, a hard time with nuance where it's like, you know, it's not an absolute thing, guys. Like there's, yeah, was COVID real? Yeah, of course it was, but like, we don't know anything else. <laughs> like, we know COVID is real, but we don't know anything else. Basically, no one can confirm anything. Was the election re- real or not? Well, we have no idea. Like, who's who can audit the election? Like, we know the election happened, but we don't know anything else about it. <laughs> you know, like all these things. And that's what Bitcoin does. It it brings trust and verifiability, you know, verifiability uh, audit auditing back into the system. So, it just man, we could we could spend whole like things, which you know we can keep rolling this, but it makes me think of um. Like, again, you, you said this in another interview too, and I really resonate with this, but like generalists um, and talking about generalists versus specialists and how like Robert Kiyosaki is one of my mentors from 15 years ago, really one of the first people that really got me, like I was saying earlier, when, when the great financial crisis happened at Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street and learning about money, creature from Jekyll Island, going into that these rabbit holes. And he would talk about there's too many specialists and specialists see their world through, they vote that way. They, everything in their life is through their job, basically. And they're this, you know, 
the paycheck makes them slaves to that. And then in really it's debt. And that's the reason the debt shackles and bondage and the, you know, so you get into that and you had touched on that. So it really resonated with me where humans are meant to be, I think at least generalists where they can do, we can do, adapt. We can do a lot of different things. And because we've been so like put into this little like bucket of like, well, you're just going to be 20 years, you're 40 years. You're just going to do this little thing. And you, you know, you vote that way and everything you see is through that prism. I would love for you to kind of touch on that and just your thoughts in that world. Doesn't mean you can't have specialists. I'm not saying that specialism drives progress in society too, but again, there's nuance to it. So I'd love for you to kind of touch on this and your, your sentiment here. Yeah, I absolutely love this topic. Um, <laughs> I think I love this topic because I've been a generalist my whole life and it <laughs> can look like you're a, yeah, exactly. I'm extremely biased. Yeah. And part of me, like a fear or like an insecurity that I have myself is that am I just not disciplined and I just chase whatever interesting thing is right in front of me. And then I try to justify it by defending <laughs> generalists. Right. So I'm, I'm always cautious of that. Like, don't be a dilettante. Um, in the back of my head. Um, but I, I do think that fundamentally our biology is that we are generalists. That's, that's what humans are. We're problem solvers with a mm -hmm. flexible brain who can adapt to any situation. Um, if you look around most animals, they form a niche with their environment and they get really specialized in their niche. If their niche changes due to climate or otherwise, most organisms cannot make that change. Whereas humans, we can reinvent ourselves. We, we colonize pretty much the entire planet. And what that means is we have the coastal fishermen people. We have the winter people who follow around all the, the ungulates on the Great Plains. And they literally just associate with the buffalo or the caribou or whatever. We have the people like the tiny little people who live in the islands and they eat coconuts and barely any animal protein. Point being, we're flexible. And if bad things happen to us, we feel really bad, we're down. And then two weeks later, we snap out of it and we adapt and we just like, oh, this is our new normal. We just get by. So we are generalists. Fact. Now, in modern society, we introduce the Industrial Revolution. We introduce um, a more complex society. Now, all of a sudden, there's situations where being a specialist pays dividends. And so society more and more and more has led us to become, we're incentivized to specialize more and more. But at, at, there's a cost to the individual. If you're a specialist, um, you actually make poor decisions and you're not fulfilled. I think on average, generally speaking, um, we're supposed to wake up, go in the sun, go for a jog, find some food, swim in the river, uh, play with our kids, spend time with our spouse, um, go to war sometimes, hunt a buffalo, whatever. We're supposed to do all that in a day or a week. And now we wake up. We stare at a small screen, then we go sit at a desk and we stare at our medium screen. And then at the end of the day, if we're lucky, we stare at a big screen while often checking our small screen. Like that is not what we evolved for, right? And you know, you, you wonder why people are fat, sick and unhealthy and whatever. Uh, we're not living in congruence with our biology. We are so far from our biology. Our bodies are screaming at us to go for a walk, get some sun, eat real food. And we're like, oh, no, we'll just think our way out of it. No, no, that's all nonsense. Uh, we need to go back to the fundamentals of what our meat suit needs. And if we do that, depression, metabolic syndrome, anxiety, many other things like woes of modernity will start to just slowly disappear from society. Uh, I don't think we're ready to have that conversation at the mass scale, but I, I believe that strongly. Um, you mentioned one other thing about generalist versus specialist at the individual level. I think the right approach to let's say approach career or purpose or how to give make, create value in the world is to be a generalist. Um, but that doesn't mean you treat all disciplines equally. It means that you need to go in and lean into the things that you're unnaturally good at. And that could be, what do you love doing? Because if you love something, you're going to iterate on it over and over and over again, genuinely for pleasure. And it's not going to be work and you're going to get good at it eventually. And then maybe you overlap that with some other subject that you genuinely love. And over time, you have like multiple spheres of competency. And then your unique value in the world is you overlay those things. And all of a sudden, you're competing against no one uh, because you're the you're the most knowledgeable Bitcoin plus mycelium and mycology guy in the world. 
And that's a totally made up thing that shouldn't be useful. And I, I still can't believe it's real, but all of a sudden you get that and you have a reputation and that opens doors. That's how you get jobs in the industry. Um, and that's totally wild, right? I'm obviously using myself as an example here, but I do encourage people to follow their nose and don't worry about, is this the right next career step? Fuck that. Does this light you up? Does it give you energy? Um, you don't need to know how the puzzle pieces fit together in the future. First of all, it's, it's hubristic to even believe you can plan your life methodically one step at a time. That's nonsense. You can't. So you, it's, it's a false security anyways. Um, second, let's be romantic about life a little bit. Sometimes you take a detour and you don't know why. And later in life, you have some clarity and you realize how important that detour was. If you're bright eyed and you're paying attention in the world, that's actually how life works. And I think we should celebrate uh, those detours and not take life so seriously. Celebrate the detours, take a mini career break at 25 and travel and explore some weird interests that doesn't make sense or doesn't fit into your story. Um, in hindsight, I think if you just pursue life this way, I think in hindsight, it will be obvious uh, the value of those detours. And not all, de not all detours are gonna be obvious. Maybe some detours are genuinely detours. But you have to take a risk. You have to explore in order to later then exploit. And so I'm on team, lots of weird hobbies, explore, explore, explore. And then when you do find something interesting, go hard at that and, and exploit that, that opportunity you do have. Yeah, I, I love that. I love the way you put that. What it makes me think of what what is your advice to you know, maybe – like, I don't know how best to say it, content creators or marketers or people in this space. I mean, you, you know, people that are, are writing or doing, you know, video or maybe marketing for Bitcoin businesses. What are, what are some of the things that you've learned over the last handful of years? We talked about some of it in a way of, you know, show lightly and things like that, um, different tactics, but what are some of the things you've kind of picked up over the last handful of years that have really, you know, kind of supercharged what you do in your work, you know, in, with Swan? Yeah, good question. Um, I still believe that writing is a, a complete superpower. Um, I think it does two things in modern society. One, um, even if you don't publish something or maybe you share with your friends or whatever, just the act of writing something that you will stand behind that you would feel comfortable publishing, it radically transforms your thinking. And I love ideas. I get high on ideas. I get high on thinking about ideas. The eureka moment when all the puzzle pieces finally fit in your head and you're like, whoa, pure clarity. I live for that moment, right? And so I have unlimited ideas, literally unlimited. But then when I sit down to write, I'm like, oh, I got this one. I'm gonna just pound this out because it's all clear in my head. And then you realize when you put pen to paper that your idea is entirely half-baked. You haven't stress tested it from all other angles. You haven't built it up from the ground floor logically step-by-step step, from one premise to the next. And you realize that you don't know what you're talking about. And then the, the writing process forces you, if you're being honest and you care about your work, to go back and check your notes and, and figure out what you actually intended to say. And that involves relearning, that involves like stress testing ideas or whatever. So you finish that process. Okay, now I publish something, it doesn't matter what. I feel confident in what I'm saying now, because there's a social cost to me publishing this and people I respect making fun of me if it's bad. I'm kind of exaggerating, but you get what I mean. That pressure forces you to think harder. And so number one, writing makes you smarter. It makes you understand your ideas. It makes your brain think more logically. It allows you to communicate these ideas uh, more eloquently later because you really understand them. And I, I personally believe that I don't actually, I don't want to like stand behind any of my ideas until I've gone through the writing and publishing process. Anything that I haven't done that with, I would consider myself below the bar. Sure, we can talk, we can have some conversations, but I think that actually is a really good crucible for your thinking. Um, secondly, in the digital world, it is a superpower to create content or to create code or to create media. Uh, Naval Ravikant, who I would say, I consumed everything he's ever produced, uh, met him, had good conversations with him. I consider him someone that I uh, very much look up to. Um, I don't like his like crypto angle, but from like a life philosophy standpoint, I align uh, very heavily here. And he has a comment about infinite leverage in the digital age. 
Meaning I write a blog post once and I spend a hundred hours on it and then a million people read it for the next hundred years. Or I write some software once that everyone uses, or I create a, a YouTube channel that I create once that everyone can, can watch, right? And so in that type of world, that's extremely powerful. And so I'll, I'll share my personal anecdotes. I've been writing online since 2014. I ran a business prior to Bitcoin, post Oracle, like corporate sales guy. Then I did five years in entrepreneurship. Part of that business was uh, content marketing. I got very good at that uh, for the business purposes. And then I started applying those same skills to Bitcoin and what, what you find out is that creating content online creates unlimited inbound opportunities for yourself if you do a good job. If it's your business, maybe it's just traffic coming to your site, read a blog post, get on the email list, buy the product later. If it's an individual, uh, write about a topic you care about, ship it, people resonate with the ideas, and then you're getting inbound saying, whoa, cool, let's talk about this, or hey, your idea has changed how I think about things, um, and it creates friends creates job opportunities. It creates uh, collaboration. It enriches your life. And again, I probably get one DM a week about Bitcoin and mycelium. I don't really even talk about this anymore. I don't write about it anymore. I mean, occasionally. But I wrote this thing in uh, 2018, right? And it's still delivering value to my life. And so wow. if anyone's questioning, oh man, should I write? Should I not? Like I would say the internet is saturated with shit content so if you're just gonna like write to write don't you don't make videos to make videos but if you feel um you have something to say you have something unique to say uh you want to take a risk you're exploring new ideas i say go for it um there's an unlimited appetite for good ideas and new ideas um now i don't want this to, to like some people hear that and say oh well, i don't have anything interesting to say so i'll never try that's not the takeaway most people need to write a lot and the writing's gonna suck for a while before you publish anything that doesn't suck. And so just like any new skill, you need to have a beginner mind, you need to go hard and realize that everyone who's good at something started out bad at it, and that's gonna be true with writing. And so just get fall in love with the process of learning new skills and accept the fact that uh, you're actually brave and you're strong by doing things you suck at and iterating. Um, there's no, there's no points for like being scared of trying new things and only doing things you're good at. That's loser mentality. So um, yeah, <laughs> let's get on the plus one lifestyle and iterate and learn and, and, and go for it. Love that. Yeah, it makes me think of uh, another Bucky Fuller thing, I believe. I know Kiyosaki talked about a lot, but I, I think it's from Bucky Fuller, I'm pretty sure, which is artifacts. You know, you're creating artifacts. There's only, there's only a few things you can really pass down in life. Jim Rohn talks about it. Journals, photos, money. You know, there's some some of the only things you can really pass down in life. So obviously articles, books, you know, you write or whatever it might be, but there's not a lot you can pass to your family other than some of those things and just in general creating artifacts. So it's such a cool thing and a cool lesson, I think, to, to learn and for people to do. And you touched on that too with the writing, being meditative and really helping you through thinking through and uh, getting through these these thought processes. So I think that's such a such a cool um, lesson to learn and, and thing to share. In, in, in transitioning a little bit, I know we're, we're getting toward the end here. I wanted to touch on, before we do a little lightning round, a little word association game, I wanted to touch on just energy. And, um, you know, again, you were talking about this. I forget which podcast <clears throat> over the last year or so you were talking about this, but and just, you know, constantly people telling us energy is bad. And, and it goes along with, uh, again, I, I didn't want to rehash all the stuff. Like you said, you wrote this article years ago and I'll link it in here. People can go read the article, obviously. And it, uh, you know, the mycelium and Bitcoin is just, it, it's phenomenal. And so everyone could, should go read if they haven't. However, you know, energy is life, you know, so kind of transitioning from that to energy is life. And you, you've talked about this at length as well too. And, you know, we need energy to flourish. Humans need energy. Uh, everything needs energy. Life needs energy. And the more energy there generally is, the more life is flourishing. And we have this world where it's upside down and the people that are running things seemingly don't want us using energy. So it's kind of kind of weird there. You know, there's a lot of weird things going on. But b between that and the importance of energy and people really grasping that, and then also just Bitcoin mining in general, um, t tangentially related, but just using energy obviously to secure this system and how bitcoin mining itself like do we have we even grasped how 
how much life is going to change because of Bitcoin mining. And I, again, I don't know if this is Preston's or one of them, you were talking about this and kind of going down this road a little bit. But this is something I've been thinking about too, of like, we're, we haven't even like touched the fraction of an, of the iceberg yet of how much mining is going to change earth, you know, and just human civilization and flourishing. So I would love for you to kind of touch on this as we gear toward the end of uh, and see your thoughts on, on just mining and energy usage. Yeah. Thank you for this one. I love this question so much. So um, let's start from the top. Um, I think that right now there is a pervasive narrative, let's say from the coastal elites, the New York Times, the credential class, Davos, WEF, whatever you want to use as the proxy. Um, coming out of that world, we're hearing things like use less energy, track your carbon credits, don't do this, don't fly a plane, don't eat meat. Uh, we got to reduce our energy. Okay, this is my belief. This comes out of a neo Malthusian fear. And Malthus was an economist in England and he was looking at bio biological systems and he realized that if you have a bunch of deer, I'm making up an example, if you have a bunch of deer on an island, and there's X amount of grass on the island. Eventually, the deer's population will grow so much that they'll consume all the food and then all the deer will die. And he just chart, he just took that premise, charted how ecological systems work. And then he said, look, humans population is growing too fast. Eventually, we're going to exceed our carrying capacity and we're all going to die. So we need to slow down population growth. And Malthus was wrong and he's wrong because he did not account for the fact that we are not mindless deer. We are problem solvers who create tools and we have the capacity through technology to increase our species carrying capacity on the planet, right? If we were all pastoralists, there wouldn't be that many people on the planet because we'd all need a few acres to get by. But no, we, we figured out ways to have harness more dense energy, to employ uh, machines to do our work, to get more yield per acre of farmland, uh, right? We put fertilizers. We've come up with all these technologies to uh, do more with less, and that allows our population to grow. And the idea that we've hit the maximum carrying capacity will never come up with new technology to make us expand our carrying capacity today. And so we got to reduce now is totally nuts. Um, I think it's bad thinking. I think it's rooted in an ideological boogeyman that doesn't actually exist. I also think that certain powers that be might be using that to hijack the conversation and hijack the masses because it's a very seductive idea that, the, that we're breaking the planet and all we got to do is get taxed more and eat the bugs and live in the pod and then the government will change the weather. Um, this is crazy. And I think that I don't want to get down the climate change route, but it's for sure being used as a tool of control. Um, and that's a bad thing. And so I think that's generally the context we're in here. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the, the way around this is to look at facts and data and, and like, what's the reality here? And the reality is that humans harnessing energy is what makes us flourish. It's the single most, it's the highest correlation to human success, human achievement is how much energy does a, does a population harness. And, and so all the good things we like about society are downstream of harnessing energy. Energy is the master commodity. It makes all our goods cheaper. It makes us warm in the winter and cold in the summer. It makes us have food and medicine. And if your kid's born prematurely, we can put them in an incubator so they survive uh, because we have enough power near the hospital to achieve that and millions of other examples. And so it's my belief that we need to totally retake over this narrative around energy. Um, we're not running out. That's nonsense. We capture like 0.00001% of the sunlight that hits our planet. Um, so we have a long ways to go. We've never consumed less energy. You look at the chart, we come up with new energy sources. We just add them on. We have an unlimited demand for energy. That's the reality. And so we're, we're not going to stop that. And if you want to stop that, sure, we can go back to, uh, I don't know, half a billion people and live like uh, nomadic pastoralists and like die from all these preventable things and just like generally have a lower quality of life. We could do that as a species, theoretically. 
Um, but if you want to get rid of fossil fuels, we're getting rid of all the modern amenities that we like. And so it's not actually a tenable path. There's no political will for this. And if one country does it, they're just committing suicide for their country and the next country will gladly consume all their energy. And so I think the reality is that we want more energy, more widely distributed across the planet at a lower cost. And if you actually care about humanitarian efforts, that's the probably the single most important thing you can do. It's like make people not poor. And one way to do that is to give them low cost energy because that everything downstream of low cost energy increases human flourishing. So that's my slight rant there. How does this intersect with Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin miners are a unique consumer of energy. And what they're unique for is because they can go where the energy source is. That's one thing. So they can move wherever you are. And if you look around the world, energy is not globally fungible. If I'm in the middle of Iceland and I have geothermal energy in the ground and no one's nearby, that energy is not worth anything because there's no consumers, right? So you yeah. could build expensive transmission lines and ship that energy to a population center. Very expensive, takes years to build out. Uh, maybe we'll do that, maybe not. Uh, what if you have remote hydro in the middle of the mountains in some remote area in Africa and there's no population nearby? No one's buying the energy, so it's worth nothing. And so essentially these Bitcoin miners are able to locate on site wherever energy could be harnessed and then they buy that energy immediately. And if all of a sudden a population center builds up around that energy source and an end user consumer or a hospital is willing to buy that energy at a higher cost, they're going to outcompete the Bitcoin miners because the Bitcoin miners can only take the lowest cost energy on our planet. And so you add up all these incentives and what it looks like is Bitcoin miners incentivize generating net new energy assets. And in some cases, Bitcoin miners are the single reason an energy project got off the ground instead of died on the vine. So if you look in, um, let's say, rural Africa, I think this is uh, an example that's showing some fruit right now. Companies like Gridless are harnessing uh, these incentives to bring energy to the most remote places on the continent. And OK, why isn't there energy there now? Well, because the main grids in Africa it's not cost effective for them to run transmission lines out to the middle of nowhere. And so they'll never do it. Um, it will be a losing enterprise. No capital will form to achieve that. Then you say, well, what about nonprofits? What about government agencies? Um, sometimes they help out here, but the reality is um, if there's no ROI on a project, it's hard to get funding for things. Those take years and they're not getting the job done. Enter Bitcoin miners. Okay, so all of a sudden you want to raise money to set up a micro micro grid in the middle of nowhere. Well, the population nearby isn't big enough necessarily to buy enough energy to see an ROI on the energy asset, which means the energy asset never gets produced, which means they never have energy. Enter Bitcoin miners. You can go tap a micro hydro dam in the middle of nowhere and whatever the local consumers don't purchase, the Bitcoin miners will purchase. And so what does that do? That makes their energy asset profitable immediately, or at least on a reasonable time frame, which leads to more, incent more incentive to invest. And so the net net here is that Bitcoin miners will bring more energy online in areas where it might not have been economical prior, which literally spreads prosperity around the globe. And there's no subsidy involved here. There's no NGO involved here. It's literally market forces who will do this profit motivated today and it's happening all over the world. And the, the positive externality is human flourishing, more energy, raising people out of poverty. Um, that's a beautiful thing. And I think it's not easy to grapple with these ideas. I think energy is widely misunderstood. And so it's taken some time, I would say, for a culture to accept these things. Most Bitcoiners five years ago had no clue about any of this stuff, never saw it coming, cool. never studied energy. And we're obviously the first ones to grapple with this thing because we're obsessed with Bitcoin and whatever. Um, but I think the, the powers that be, the journalists, they're starting to realize that they can't use lazy narratives anymore because they're just wrong. And so... Yeah, we're starting to see a, a, a shift in this exact narrative. 
in the media and it's still a tiny understanding like most people have no clue but we're starting to see a shift and shout out to all the people that have worked really hard to make these uh, organizations understand what's going on but we're making progress here um, more energy more flourishing this is the way yeah, i love it so well said. And it, I, again, I don't, I don't know if I closed the loop even earlier, what I was saying, I mean, you made me think of, again, like this, the capitalism being, it's hard to build on uh, sand, which is fiat, you know, and now we have the monetary bedrock, which is, you know, aided by the mining, the proof of work, the difficulty adjustment, all these things are, are the bedrock of a civilization where now you can have whatever you call it, I guess, capitalism slash volunteerism, whatever it ends up being, right? And I think that's the beauty of it. I love that you you touched on the Malthusians as well. That's, again, I think that's like some of the stuff that people really need to go back in. And I know it helped put into perspective a lot for me just over the last handful of years, just the Malthusians. And then you ironically now have Columbia, where the Frankfurt School, 100 years ago, them coming, sending their teachers over, and that being ground zero for a lot of what we're seeing here today in academia. And then ironically, you have the protests going on in Colombia. I mean, it's just like, it's the, the we live in a simulation. I mean, it's just wild. And then I know Mark Moss has been talking about uh, lately, the Cloward and Piven stuff, uh, overwhelming the, the system. So all this stuff kind of works together, comes together. And uh, so people should go look at a bunch of that stuff that you were just kind of throwing out there because it, it really explains a lot of where we're at right now. So uh, well said. Um, Cool. I know we're at the end here. Um, I want to do a little word association game with presented by Bitcoin trading cards. So we'll do a little lightning round and throw, I'll throw a, a word out and then just throw a word back, whatever you think. So whatever comes off the top of your head and uh, we'll rock through them here. Satoshi Nakamoto. Legend. <laughs> I think it's one of the, the, the most common answers I get there. Legend. Or legend or genius. Um, mycelium. Prometheus. I'll, I'll, I'll update and say Prometheus. Ooh. Give you something new. It wasn't the first thing that came to my head, but I think it's a cool one. Uh, oh, mycelium. Yeah. Um, Earth's natural internet. Mm. Politics. Ugh. Is that a word? Oh. <laughs> no Italian thanks. buterin. Oh man, misguided genius. Hubris. Two, I'll give you two for that one. I like it. Travel. Oh, man, I struggle with single words. Uh, <laughs> enriching. Oh, like it. Peter Schiff. <laughs> Great entertainer. <laughs> yeah, that, I like that. Oh man, capitalism. The only possible approach. Mm. Three letter agencies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm bad at this. I'll give you something longer. I think that good intention, uh, maybe for being charitable on formation, but humans destroy institutions over time. That is the natural state of things. So we should delete them all and only bring back future ones that we uh, have good justification for. I love it. Oh, man. Uh, writing. Superpower. Here's a pick one of these three, I guess. This is not a one word answer, but well, it kind of is, I guess. Sports, art, or music? Music. Human psychology. It's all about biology, baby. Mm. Energy. Life. Christine Lagarde. <laughs> a criminal. <laughs> Literally, that's a fact. Actually, a fact. Oh, man. Brady Swenson. Oh, man. Brother from another mother. I love that. Exactly what I thought you'd say. Uh, Bitcoin trading cards. <laughs> My favorite physical art project in Bitcoin. And, and I'm honored smart. to be on the card, although something yeah. got screwed up. I got a one of one or something. <laughs> Wrong story. There. <laughs> with, with the, we'll have to run it back here at some point. I know there's some some things in the work uh, over time here. So we'll have, to, we'll have to run them back here somehow, some way. So 
might be new art though. So you might have the only, you might have the only one of one ever, truly one of one. So we wow. shall see. That's yeah. exciting. Um, and Swan. Beast. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much, brother. Where can people find you? Yeah, all my writing is at my name, brandonquidham.com. Otherwise, the only social media I'm really active on is Twitter. Um, not that active lately as a new father in a growing startup, yeah. but I'm on Twitter. That's the best place to find me. Uh, DMs are open. B Quidum is the handle. You search my name. Yeah. Yeah. And- Come say hello. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of that too, your your little one is a year, almost a year old, right? Getting there. Uh, twenty months. He's 20 a months. little bro now who walks okay. and runs around and throws balls and yeah, it's been That's it's so been cool. a treat. <laughs> it, it's life changing, isn't it? It's the best. Fatherhood is a trip. Oh, one more. Uh, if you want to get started with Bitcoin, I work for Swan uh, Financial Services company centered around Bitcoin. You can go to swan.com slash quitum. And if you if you sign up there, you'll get ten dollars in free Bitcoin just for creating an account. And we're doing ten thousand dollars in purchases with no fee. So either your first ten k spend with Swan, we don't charge a fee, or if you're already a customer, your next ten k spend no fee. There's no qualifications that can be in your IRA, that can be in your normal brokerage account. Doesn't really matter. We're doing that as a uh, way to let people try out the platform. And we don't make that much money on our retail clients anyways. So it's kind of a user acquisition, throw one out for the homies um, type strategy for us. People ask like, well, how do you make money? Uh, We make money lots of different ways. So the company is healthy and uh, yeah, we're going fast. We're uh, early stage of a bull market. So it's wild at Swan lately. And I'm really proud of what we built and we'd love to have you come check us out. Love it, man. Well, I appreciate you, Brandon, for coming on, being more importantly than coming on, being a playable character and forwarding this mission in a sea of non-playable characters. So thank you, brother. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Appreciate it. If you like this interview with Brandon Quidham, then you're going to love the interview I just did with Jeff Booth recently, where we talked about AI and Bitcoin. Or you might love the one I just did with Larry Lepard recently, where we talked about the Bitcoin ETFs. Come on, check it out. You're going to love it. Come on.